So Robert, thanks for joining me today. And we're going to have our real estate chat. And uh, for those of you who have never seen Robert or heard from him before or read his blog, it is at unclebobexplains.wordpress.com. Eventually, it'll be at unclebobexplains.com, right, Robert? Right. Awesome. So we're going to be talking about one of his most recent blog posts, and it is entitled, What Should I Do? Buy, Sell, or Hold? And it's and Robert, I highly admire him for his stats ingenuity. I consider him a mentor when it comes for me deciphering what's happening in the market, uh, the real estate market. I rely heavily on a lot of his charts, his statistics, and his insight. And so it's an honor to have him here today. And so Robert, let's get into this blog post, and I'm going to share it on screen here. Basically, it, it's asking the question that many of us in the real estate industry and many of the clients of real estate agents and practitioners are asking what to do in this market. And I want you to sort of go into what your charts explain. And we're going to be talking about a couple of things for this blog post. And hopefully anybody watching this or listening to this will be able to navigate based on this information, what the right move is for them. Let's start with your first chart here showing 2020, 2021, and 2022 year to date versus the five year and 10 year average. So anybody looking to buy or sell or transact in real estate, what should they glean from this, from what you're showing us? Well, you can see the average and that's the reason for the average is to determine what normal is. And so are we ahead of normal? Are we behind normal? And trying to guess what the future might be based on what the past used to be. Um, there's another one that has all kinds of years. It's even more confusing. I had a fellow reply to receiving this saying, what's all these squiggly lines? I can't understand it. So I simplified it to show the 2020, which was COVID time which like went crazy bad and then came crazy up in a miraculous recovery and then continued on into wild, wild, wild world record territory of 2021 with the best month of all time, nearly 15,000 units in uh, 2021. And then even though it went down, these were the best ever, best ever, second, third best of all time. Like you can't be the best every single month, but if you're the second best, this is my saying, if you're the second best salesman, every month in a real estate office, then you get to be a salesman of the year. What so, do you think that, so sorry to interrupt. So pandemic time, things were in the lockdown yep. and the whole future of real estate sales at that point was being questioned in terms of where, where it would go. What could have possibly resulted or what, what drove these months to become the best of all time? Uh, okay, uh, part of it was uh, relief from the lockdown and someone saying, if I'm gonna go, then I'm gonna take advantage of the time that I have right now. Then you also had the investment class, like you got always owner occupiers and the investment class, which I'm gonna try not to disparage because some people, they live on that class, but I believe specs have no place in the real estate residential market, less than three units, because that's for owner occupiers. Anyway. At the time, interest rates had been banged down to low, 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 low. You could get it in the ones, you could get it in the twos. And interest, I'm sorry, inflation was announced to be, the goal was to be in the twos. So if you take interest minus uh, inflation, you got zero free money. So people were taking advantage of free money and the monthly payments that resulted from that in order to buy up from where they were, either a bigger house further away or leave town. Um, as, as you remember, it was a crazy time when all of our systems were thrown out of whack. The whole country was on government subsidy, CRB, C, whatever they called it. And uh, it was just on hold waiting for this terrible plague to come washing over us and kill millions and then go away. So some of that happened, some of that didn't. But when it was over, when the release came and people said, I'm going to take advantage of the time. And then you had a rally. It's, it's like jump on the bandwagon before it's too late of everybody buying anything they could get their hands on. Futures, everybody's speculating. Everybody's saying, oh, okay, I can buy this condo. I don't have to take delivery for seven years. I can buy this new house. I don't have to take me for four years. And sometimes that worked out. I had two clients specifically, one my daughter who sold. The thing was delayed because of COVID. So they didn't sell their house. And by the time after a year of stoppage, they took possession of the house. They had made an extra, it was $600,000 house. They made an extra 300 on their house 
just by because of the luck of the time. That's so amazing. there was a certain amount of that. And if there's more reasons than that, I can't think of any. There are some people who are highly sophisticated that think that the currency was being undermined and they want to buy tangible assets. They were buying silver, they were buying gold, they were buying real estate. And so that also drove the price up in much more than it ever would have been if there wasn't a, um, a, a, a flight to tangible assets. Basically, quite a number of things contributed to the increase in sales, the rise in prices, lower interest rates, cheap money to be borrowed, money printing, all sorts of things. And then I guess the demand as well, because of the fact that when you're seeing the supply or the number of homes for sale diminishing, and you sort of want to be going into that uh, mode of home ownership, it's, it's just a fear of missing out that drove prices up. And then that perpetually created diminishing inventory. So high demand, lower supply, and so that just continued pushing the prices up. So when we go back to your chart here now mm -hmm. and saw the after effects of that and looking and leading into 2022 now mm -hmm. where we're seeing the the prices drop and, and sales are dropping as well. Uh, where, what kind of a situation are we in now you describe relative to where we were before and how should somebody navigate the current market? Um, as you can see, the beginning of this year was the second best January ever. It was the second best February ever. It was the third best March ever. Like it can't be the first best month every time. And it was just going all everything. But then there was threatened, terrible things are going to happen. The prices are going to fall down. Interest rates are going to go up. Interest rates are going to go up. Into every day you, you saw them. Um, so then it happened that people finally said the emperor has no clothes and I'm not paying 1.3 for this semi in Oak Ridges anymore and, or townhouse. And uh, they just said, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm in shell shock. I'm, I've lost confidence. Let's say it's they lost confidence. And when they lose confidence and find they are gaining by doing nothing, then they continue to do that. Like inertia is the strongest force of nature. If just like fear of missing out is a, I better jump on the bandwagon then if I've jumped off the bandwagon and I'm gaining from that jumping off, then I'll continue to do that until I've proven to be wrong by doing so. So um, right now, like if you look at the news, you don't know what to think. Some sources are reliable, some sources are unreliable. Some people think the interest rates are going to go up forever, that it's got to be the rate of inflation, which is somewhere around six or eight percent, and the interest is, has got to be at least that or higher, which would just kill everything. It's in nobody's best interest for that to happen, but it might. But it might. We saw two times recently, recently, in uh, the 80s and in the 90s when they pushed interest rates up crazy. And uh, they can't do it now because all the numbers are so much larger. We're, then we were talking about $100,000 houses. Now we're talking a million dollar houses. The numbers are just so, so crazy. And interest, interest rates affect real estate and monthly payments. It's like leasing a car. You say, okay, how much do I have to put down? How much is the lease going to be? And at how long, what's it, what, what are my circumstances going to be at the other end? In this case, you gain equity. If the property goes up in value, then you get something more at the end it's like now, if you sell, if you'll sell your leased car, uh, you have a built-in equity there because the price of used cars has gone up in the meantime. You didn't plan it; you just good fortune. So the question is, what do we do next? Aha! So we got three months of turbulence, and we don't know anything. We're going to have July results come up very soon, or June results come up now, early July. We're just going to say it's six thousand units, which is again the twentieth best month ever, continuing the trend that you see in the chart. And um, interest rate, you're going to have another meeting. And then the Americans who are actually one meeting behind us will have a meeting. And then they're going to have a report tomorrow on what CPI or what American CPI is, what our CPI is. And then they're going to say, okay, have we already killed a dragon using the wrong tool so far? Or do we have to switch tools or can we continue what we're doing? Remember, the CPI is a measure of something that has already been. It's a measure of the difference between what is being supplied a year ago at a certain price and what is being paid for today. And what it doesn't allow for is quality. If you used to buy a steel uh, widget and you paid a dollar for it, now you're buying a plastic widget to serve the same purpose, but it's not as good, then that's the measure of what you're buying, not the measure of the quality. And that's the thing that's missing from CPR. 
And it's always late and it's always low because they do it on purpose. So um, right now, the thing, there's three classifiers for that classification of the buyers. First time buyers don't have a property now. Last time sellers, someone who's going to sell and never buy again, and someone who's going to trade up, buy a buy sell customer that they want to know, what do I do first? What do I do second? The, the last time seller says, how can I sell at the peak and keep all the money as much as possible? And the first time buyer wants the opposite of that. So the market is driven by the first time buyer. Market at the bottom pushes all the way up, uh, percolate up if there's such a thing. So um, that's a long talk about nothing. Ask me a question if you want a more specific answer. Sure. Well, I mean, we're looking at uh, the current market situation and, um, you know, there's a lot of questions. The, for example, does the interest rate and affordability have a correlation with price? And you and I have chatted before about uh, some who have put stats together to, search, to show that, yes, as interest rates drop, prices were going up. So therefore, the inverse should be true that if interest rates go up, prices go down. In fact, it is happening, but there is an inverse there relationship. Things, yeah. So how much of an effect will that be? So would it be fair to say then that somebody looking to transact in real estate now who's sitting on the fence, let's say I am a first time buyer okay. and I'm very worried about interest, interest rates yep. continuing to climb. Yep. Would it be fair to say that, hey, because I know that there's an inverse relationship, I should just wait until interest rates start to go down again and then go in and enter the market and prices for sure at that point will start to go up. At least I won't be buying and then losing losing equity or losing money. Okay, that's really what prompted the long uh, words on that block. As a fellow responded to those two charts and said, what should I do? Now, I thought it was him who was a trade customer. It was actually for his cousin who's a first time buyer. So <clears throat> what the first time buyer has to realize is they are they missed it once. And if they don't watch out, if they continue, they're, they're gonna miss it again. They're gonna wait till it's past the bottom. They're gonna wait till it's already going. So what they have to do is pretend they're still an active buyer and go and get pre-approved. And so they know they can spend $648.38 and continue to save their down payment, working towards buying that $638,000. Now, if interest rates stay the same, they'll be qualified. If interest rates go down, they'll be, uh, maybe they can pay more, they can have lower payments, or if they can run into a creative financing situation, maybe they can have the best of both worlds. They can pay an off peak price and get lower than peak financing rates and slay all these dragons at once. So what they have to realize is that for 25 years, we had a seller's market. So none of the salesmen are familiar with buyer's market conditions. There's a few in our office, there's a fellow named Carlos Law, who is a car salesman, got into the real estate business, and he knows how to haggle. He is not afraid to take a low offer in on a place if he knows the seller's got to sell. So if you're the first time buyer client, then you have to find out where you want to live, what kind of a house do you want? And start watching that. We have an excellent Hallmark app that any of our salesmen can uh, lead over to you or the Toronto Real Estate Board has a thing where you get the first hand data sent to you overnight, boom, prospect match. And start concentrating on that row house, on that semi, on that small detached, on that giant mansion home, mansion home on a huge lot backing on ravine, whatever it is your target. And start watching that because you're not going to buy now. You got to wait till all of the gusto has gone out of the seller. You got to wait till the seller that's absolutely got to sell pops up and says, I give up. He reduces his price. Maybe he does another auction and you can pounce on it, but you can only pounce on it if you are aware, number one, of what that house would have sold at at the peak and what everything around there has been doing. You don't have to watch the whole market. You only have to watch that area of Markham or Scarborough or Etobicoke or Peel region that you want to live in, and you can get to know that in three months, as well as any real estate that's been in the business for 10 years knows, because you're only watching one thing, nothing else. So then you just watch, then watch and watch until you see that one. You're not looking at the market, you're not buying the market, you're buying one, and you're going to live in it. And so you want to get the very best street, you want to get the best school district, you want to get the least work that you have to do, you want to buy the best one. But right now for how many years? Seven, 10, since 2009? We've been scrambling ever. Let me just find one that miss, meets the price point. So it's all reversed to what we've all gotten used to. So what's old is new again. 
you know, the salesman will adjust. Salespeople will adjust. Registrants will adjust that in two, three months, they'll say, oh, this is how I have to now behave. I'm now representing a slightly different buyer and I'm going to kiss his butt a little bit more than I ever did before. I'm going to get a contract with him. And the seller, I'm going to be a little bit more heavy handed with saying, no, I don't think you should go over 900,000 asking price and be prepared to be a little more firm and be able to prove it nine ways than you ever did before. So what okay. should I do? It yeah. depends on whether as a, as a client, your first time buyer, last time seller, buy, sell customer, but it's really the same thing. Decide when you want to sell and decide why you want to sell. And like some people will think I'm crazy for saying this, but I'll say it anyway. What is the worst case scenario? Is the worst case scenario, all of the money across the world will collapse. And so everything that you have that's evaluated in dollars will be worth next to nothing. And if that's, is that going to happen? And if that's going to happen, is it going to happen in three months, three years, 30 years? And do your planning backwards. Are you 45, 55, 65, 75? Because it all makes a difference. It's not a matter of financial planning. It's where you live. Everybody's got to live somewhere. So you don't screw around with that one. That's the last one that you sell. It's the one you hang on to the longest. It's the one you try not to refinance because you got to live there and you got to pay for it. So is that enough? Yeah, so for a buyer, it's really, you know, does this purchase make sense for me financially and not necessarily a matter of waiting, but if you want to wait for the opportune time, you wait until you see certain indicators in the market start to reverse its current course, right? So uh, we'll talk about the 90s and what happened there. I mean, that's an entire conversation in itself that's going to be separate, uh, and that's going to be a good one. But basically, if you're looking at what's happening right now, and as a first-time buyer, if you're if you're thinking, hey, you know, I think prices are going to keep going down a bit. I mean, one thing is why not make an offer at what you think the price will be or should be, and see if that goes because it it may you may get that that offer. Um, otherwise, it's just whatever financially makes sense. But would you recommend to just for a buyer to literally just wait for that transition point okay. where so I said too many things at once, what the buyer who is a first time buyer wants to do, he's waiting for one person to put their house up for sale. Maybe it's an estate. Maybe it's someone who's a spec that now is underwater and they, 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 they can't meet a certain due, di due, due deadline for a payment, or maybe it's who knows what they've got a deadline to divorce. And so now they're going to bail on that house. They're going to bail on that house that they normally wouldn't. They say real estate prices are sticky. If you can stay there and not lose money, then you'll stay there. You don't have to move. But if you've already committed yourself to something or some new event has come along that throws your apple cart around your timing, then you're going to, you're going to, um, you're going to need to do something at the time, no matter what else you can get. Again, Carlos Law, when the market went Lehman Brothers in late 08, he did fabulous because he looked and saw who needs to sell the worst. And he went to the, took the buyer there. And then he said, let's try and get it for this. So he's the hero when he gets this fantastic sign back, it's like 40% less than what it should have been, but it's only a committed com compelled seller that mm -hmm. will sell on those terms because they must. That's why the definition of market value is informed, not compelled. Right. So finding the right opportunity, right? If a if a first You're only time looking for one, never mind the rest of the market. If you want to live on that street in Unionville and there's a house there, then you just make sure that guy's serious about selling. Well, it's essentially don't wait. Don't wait for market conditions per se to change. Find the right opportunity. You're only buying one. You're not buying the market. And you're buying and you're buying for the long term. I mean, unless you're flipping you're it, living. which would be great. You wouldn't you wouldn't uh, it's you not Absolutely. So let's let's talk about this uh, perception lag that you mentioned, because there's a lot of information out there. The media is covering this. Social media is covering this. So you've got everybody talking about it. You've got realtors, non-realtors, uh, investors. You've got just consumers in general talking about, you know, the interest rates. Prices are going down. The market is crashing and all this sort of stuff, which is, you know, all of this amplified exposure is creating fear and uncertainty yep. but you've pointed out one very interesting thing in your blog which is the perception lag can you explain a little bit about that perception lag and how understanding that might put things into context for somebody who is in the market right now okay a perception lag doesn't mean that people don't say something that they don't really understand some of these people that are on tv and in the newspaper they have an agenda 
and they are putting forward opinions that forward that agenda. Now, real estate salespeople, they also have an agenda. They'll put forward ideas that forward their agenda, which is to make a sale this month. I don't want you to wait. I want you to make a sale this month. So the people who know what's happening exactly are not writing the news articles. The people that know what's happening exactly are the people who want to sell their house last week. And either they started too high or they turned away an offer. And now they have hardly any showings and they would just die to get anybody to put in an offer. They would just love to negotiate real hard with somebody. Maybe it's a little bit less, but they want to sell their house now. Now, the agent that happens to have that listing or maybe has two or three sellers in that situation, he knows exactly what it is. The buyer who's looking around, he says, hey, that thing was for sale two months ago. I've been looking for two months. I was for sale when I first started, but then it was 1.2 and now it's 99.98 waiting for offers. What's going on here? It's different than it was. I know there's something. So then you got people who are not very active. There's 65,000 members of the Toronto Real Estate Board. All of them have access to the statistics that automatically produce stuff and they're put up crap. There's no level of understanding. That 10 year chart is what you have to have before you can make any kind of an opinion. When they put out seasonally adjusted, forget seasonally adjusted. They're trying to adjust June so it's the same as May. June is not the same as May, ever, never, never, never. So you got to have a tenure as a benchmark. Anyway, so the people in the newspaper, everybody, everybody in the Toronto Star is a tenant. And so they put out a point of view that is aimed at tenants saying, yes, prices are going to come down. All those idiots who bought are stupid. You're smart for not having bought and rented. The people in the Globe and Mail that read that, they say, oh, you're stupid to have invested in real estate. You should have stuck with our product in the stock and bond market, and this is going to be really great, even though it's, you know, has its ups and downs over there. Always consider the source. So who knows what they're talking about? Not someone who's had their license for five years, because they've only seen one thing. This market has been the same as this. We had a blip uh, when the government intervened in 2017, went down, came, but it barely shows on a chart. 2008 down and went up in a year we were back to where we were you have to go back to 1989 to when there was a peak and it went down it went down severely for five or six years it took to trickle down and then it took a long time building back up it was related to interest rates it was related to a lot of things consumer confidence is the number one it's the number three thing supply demand consumer confidence so the, the perception lag is everybody looks out for what is their best interest and they look for things that conform with and agrees with them. If I want prices to go down because I'm a tenant and I don't wanna pay as much, then I look for signs that, so like that. Uh, you go on the TikTok, there's people that have been predicting the market's gonna crash for the last 10 years and like Garth Turner, okay? He, he's finally right. He's been wrong all this time, but now he's finally right. So so broken clock is worth tw was right twice a day. So. Anybody's got an ax to grind, everybody, anybody who's got another agenda, consider the source is uh, my answer. And then how closer to the market, that's the, that's the perception lag. That's very interesting. And of course, with that perception lag is the channel, right? It's uh, who is, uh, and this is according to your blog post, it's first, you know, who's actively in the market, then, you know, the sellers who must sell within two months. And I'm just reading this right off here, then active realtors, then the statistics show it, which you know, as, as beautiful and as informative and educational as stats are, the charts and all of that stuff that's being published, it's a lagging indicator. It basically- At least a month out of date. Exactly. It's already telling you what's already happened. Then the media comes in with their frenzy. Then every other realtor knows, the ones that are not practicing as actively as, as the ones who are currently, who are actually active in the market every day. Uh, and then it's it's everybody else, right? The sellers who are too smart for their own good in your, in your own words. So this was a fantastic conversation, Robert. Thank you so much. And you know what, we have a lot in, in this series that we're going to be talking about, especially we're going to be exploring the late 80s, early 90s, and, and that deserves uh, a conversation on its own because there's a lot of information there and there's a lot of parallels to what's happening now. There's a lot of differences yep. as well. So we're going to be saving that. So for those of you who are tuning to this, uh, stay tuned for that. that. That episode is going to come out at some point. Uh, for now, Robert, thank you so much for joining me today on this uh, real estate chat. And we will be putting Robert's contact information on the description or in the show notes, depending on where you're watching. What's the listening. office phone number again? What's that? What's the office, the office phone, phone number? 
we'll put whatever phone number you want us to put on here. So thanks so much, Robert. And thank you for those of you who have joined us and who are watching and listening to this. And we'll connect again with our next real estate chat. Stay tuned. Bye for now. See you later.